Wendell. And today we have a few of the lead characters from uh, Shakespeare's hit play, Macbeth. We're going to be looking with great detail into some of the most rash and complicated decisions they had to make during the choke points of the play, as well as character foil and general inquiries. Here he is now, the protagonist himself, Macbeth. Good morning. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Good to have you on the show. Ah, to you as well, Wendy. Can I call you Wendy? I prefer Wendell. Oh, okay. Well, it's great to be here on the show today. Isn't it always great on our show? Anyway, let's get down to it. I have many questions for you, and everyone is on the edge of their seat, waiting to hear your answers. Now, Macbeth, you first heard from the witches of your prophecy. Your reaction was somewhat here and there. What was your initial response to their sayings? Did you think they were telling the truth? Well, Wendell, I gotta tell you. At first, I wasn't sure what to think. The weird sister's words, they had merit to them. But even if they were lying, it still planted that seed in my head. I liked, the, I liked my place as general in King Duncan's army, but the thought that I could be the one commanding said army, now that pleased me. Being king, has many great perks, almost all of which to die for, or in my case, to kill for. Very true. Well, who wouldn't want to be king of this? I mean, yeah. I recall the witches told you that you were to become a fan of Kaldor. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. Little time later, you were granted this rank. Did these happenings give you any clue that what the rest of the witches said could become reality? After I was granted Thane of Kaldor, I wasn't certain that the witches knew my future or not. I needed a second opinion, so I sent word to my wife, Lady Macbeth, for my new title, and the Weird Sisters prophecy. Thank you very much, Macbeth. We'll be right back very shortly with another head role of the cast, Lady Macbeth. We've returned, and joining us now is Lady Macbeth. Thank you for coming. Why, yes it is. The sun is shining, not a cloud in the sky, perfect for our talk show. So, upon receiving and reading your husband's letter, you seem to instantly have an idea of what you wanted to happen. You wanted Macbeth to become King of Scotland. Yes, I did, of course. What better than to be married to the King? We could do whatever we want. That being true, didn't it bother you that your husband did not feel as comfortable as he could have with your plan to murder King Duncan? Was your desire to be queen more meaningful to you than your husband's conscience? I wanted what was best for the both of us. Him being king would make our lives so much better. We'd never have to work again. All right. You did eventually convince Macbeth to go through with your plan and he killed the king in your own house. Let's watch the clip.
was Mac Macbeth. Now, in this scene that we all watch, you framed the guards for the murder of King Duncan. What was your thought process when you decided to kill them after? Well, let me tell you. My head was in a different place during the whole experience. I didn't like the idea of them hopefully having an opportunity to testify that they hadn't committed, of course. I panicked him. Well, I killed him. Yes, very, very gruesome, as I stated earlier. You played this off as if you ended them out of extreme loyalty to the king. Do you feel, do you feel your obvious lie was convincing? I don't know. The way I see it, either I killed them or I hadn't. Both outcomes that would have been suspicious. Very true. On to the next question set. After you'd more or less gotten away with the murder of the king, you remembered that the prophecy foretold that Banquo's children would be the next kings. You didn't want this to happen, obviously, because you wanted to be the king until your death. Do you think having Banquo and his son slaughtered was necessary? Well, you know, murder and backstabbing is a slippery slope. There was no train back for me. Banquo knew of my prophecy and was suspicious that it had been me who killed the king. I would have had him murdered even if the children weren't supposed to become kings. Just, you know, just the way she goes, I guess. You know, the way she goes. Now, shortly after this, you received news that Banquo had been murdered, like you were correct. Okay. Later, you heard that Malcolm and Macduff were planning to move an army against you. Obviously, you did not like this. You started to prepare for the battle at your castle. During this time, shouldn't you have been caring for your wife as she was going through some tough times with her guilty conscience for planning these murders? Well, the battle that was about to come underway would kill her and I both if we were not prepared for it. So that is a good way of looking at it, I guess. When you became aware of your wife's sudden suicide, this did not disturb you at all. All, even the slightest? I had not the time for such trivial matters. It sounds terrible now, but I need to defend our castle from the incoming English. There was no time for grieving. I bear a charmed life, which must not yield to one of woman born. To spare thy charm, and let the angel whom thou still hast served tell thee. Macduff was from his mother's womb untimely ripped. Oh. Oh, cursed be that tongue that tells me so. For it hath cowed my better part of man. And be these juggling fiends no more believed that palter with us in a double sense. But keep the word of promise to our ear and break it to our hope. I will not yield to kiss the ground before young Malcolm's feet. Wow. Some powerful stuff. The opposing army breached your walls, and you were challenged to fight Macduff, to the death, more or less, likely. You did not fear anything, because the witches had earlier told you that you couldn't be killed by anyone woman-born. You were led in by your opponent that Macduff was born by C-section, and I quote, What happened then? I realized that I had been misled throughout the entire play. Since I first met the weird sisters, none of my murders or anything I'd done had been justified. Although I was facing my certain death, I did not back down.
That pretty much sums it up. For the last few questions, we'll get both you and Lady Macbeth out here for a few final thoughts. So what was it like working with Roman? Looking back, I have quite fond memories of working with Roman. He has a high attention to detail, which I now admire. At the time, I thought, you know, it was a bit excessive, but I think he produced a good product. Obviously, it stood the test of time. To this day, they are still screening his film for high school English classes around the world. You know, I totally agree with you. Roman is underappreciated in the United States. He's much better received in Europe. I think I'll leave that one alone. So Macbeth, you were definitely killed in the making of this film. Yet, here you are. Well, I'll explain that one for you. What well, most people don't know is that we went through four or five stunt doubles while recording this film. Hey, uh, Jimmy, could you play that last clip again? Thanks. Freezer right there. Perfect. So as you can see, right there is where the stun double is switched in. I see. Yeah. Old Billy Shakespeare was on the set that day and he didn't approve of how much blood we had spraying all over the place. You know, it doesn't trickle, it sprays. But, you know, Roman had this vision, you see. So we had to make it happen. Naturally. Uh, of course. One of our executive producers had to go down to Costco and use his membership to get us a big 45 gallon jug of ketchup. So you actually chopped off five people's heads to make this movie? Four or five, give or take a few. All I know is it caused a big uproar with the Screen Actors Guild and the rest of all this. Well, that's unfortunately all the time we have left for today. Uh, thank you, Macbeth, and uh, no Lady Macbeth, for uh, joining me on our talk show tonight. Uh, Pleasure having Of course, yeah. naturally, no, all all time. Time. <laughs> YOLO. <laughs> all right, so guys, uh, thank you for tuning in. Be sure to join us next time on the Talk Show. Good night, everyone.